broadcast it. Now it's broadcasting. Okay, now people can actually join it. I'm a dork. Okay. Stop, Terry. <laughs> See, now they're attendees. Oh, look, we got all these attendees coming on. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I see people. Okay, back to the panelists. All right, so I'm gonna hi everyone. That I see you guys are uh, logging in, that's great. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is our first webinar, so there's been a little bit of a learning curve for me, especially. Uh, Tara Cook-Lippman and Ann Hulick are on with me and um, we've just been sort of on the system learning it um, as we go. So we think we have it down. So hopefully this should go very smoothly. Uh, I'm really grateful that you're all able to participate. Um, this has obviously been quite a um, challenging time, especially these past few days. And I'm really glad that we're able to bring you this information. And uh, if webinars are, uh, if this really works out, then you may see more webinars because it's certainly easy to check in from home. So, uh, Again, I hope you're all doing really well. Tara Cook-Lippman is an environmental advocate from Westport. And Tara, um, do you wanna just give uh, just a little bit of your background? Oh, Tara is somehow, why is she muted? Oh, she muted herself. Okay, and would you like to give a little no, bit of your background? I'm, I'm oh, muted. Tara's back. Yeah, yeah, oh, there's Tara. just, um, I muted while folks were getting on. But um, I actually live in Fairfield next oh. to Westport. Um, but uh, I am a mom of three kids who, as Ann and Terry know, are a little overwhelmed tonight with everything going on in the world, as I'm sure many of you are. So totally appreciate you all getting on the phone. Uh, I used to be a New York City prosecutor before having children, and I've decided about I'd say 12 years ago to use my advocacy skills to work on environmental and policy issues, uh, both in Connecticut and at, um, in DC. And uh, I'm just thrilled to be able to speak to you all tonight about why we need to ban chlorpyrifos, a really toxic pesticide. Yay, I am glad. Um, and Anne, do you wanna give a little bit of background? Uh, sure, can you hear me okay? I can. All right, so um, hi, good evening everyone. Um, like Tara, I am uh, very concerned about um, toxic chemicals in products and that get into our environment and impact public health and um, pollute our environment. So I've been working on these issues for a number of years now. I'm a nurse and I was very concerned that we do a good job of treating disease, but we don't uh, do a good job of linking up the impacts of what we do to the environment to our health and the health of the ecosystem. So I am was I'm privileged to work on environmental health policy and very privileged to <laughs> tonight about some of the concerns that Tara and I are working on at the state capitol to reduce exposure to toxic chemicals and products. Thank you, Terry. Sorry, uh, thank you so much, that is great. Um, and uh, so I guess, Tara, if you want to take control and share your screen, you can start with the chlorpyrifos piece. Okay. Sorry, now everyone's probably seeing my okay. screen again, yes. Okay. Um, I am having trouble finding the um hmm are you seeing my screen right now I do. it says screen sharing yeah there you go okay there we go excellent uh sorry that that took me a little while so um i have been working on trying to get chlorpyrifos banned 
for a little over a year now. And actually last Friday, we just had the public hearing. Anne was also there testifying on banning chlorpyrifos as well as some PFAS issues. It was a really big environmental hearing last Friday. And uh, I didn't leave the hearing until one o'clock in the morning. And I was complaining that night, but now I realize we're really lucky that we got that hearing in because the Capitol is not going to be having any public hearings anytime soon now. So we need Connecticut to take action um, on banning chlorpyrifos. And in case you don't know what it is, a uh, definition is right there. It's a highly to toxic pesticide, uh, which was actually derived from a nerve gas uh, that was created during World War II. And it's actually been banned from indoor use since 2001. So the EPA back in 2000 actually realized, okay, this chemical can't be used indoors anymore to kill bugs, uh, but it was still being used outside. And this is a chemical that's been linked with many dangers. And I don't need to read all of this, you can kind of scan through, but one of the biggest issues with chlorpyrifos is that it's known to cause brain damage in children. It's also linked with Parkinson's disease. What you have to understand about chlorpyrifos is that it attacks the nervous system of bugs. So it actually has the same impact on humans when uh, we're exposed to it, either through the air or the water or by touching it, it attacks our nervous system as well. So uh, it kills bugs and it's doing major damage to humans. Um, it's also really known to be extremely harmful to wildlife. And there was actually a study done recently that showed that chlorpyrifos is the most damaging pesticide for pollinators next to neonicotinoids. So in Connecticut, we've actually taken action to curb the use of neonicotinoids, but the fact that chlorpyrifos is being used is still extremely concerning for our pollinators. And the folks that I'm particularly concerned about are the farmers, the farm workers, rural communities, and communities that are in close proximity to golf courses, because as you will learn through this presentation, Golf courses account for 86% of the use of chlorpyrifos in Connecticut. It's astounding. And at the public hearing, we heard a lot from farmers about how this would hurt them and hurt their business, and yet they only account for 10% of chlorpyrifos use in Connecticut. It's really the golf courses. So the reason that we need Connecticut to take action is because the federal government has completely abdicated their duty. In 2015, under the Obama administration, the EPA actually proposed banning chlorpyrifos. And this was based on decades and decades of scientific studies. Unfortunately, in 2017, with the turnover of the administration, uh, this proposed ban was rolled back. Now, I was actually asked during the public hearing, why should we listen to you instead of the EPA? And I said, no, I'm actually asking you to listen to the EPA. I'm asking you to listen to the EPA scientists. Their position on chlorpyrifos hasn't changed. The only thing that has changed is political appointees. So I told our Connecticut legislators that they can choose to align themselves with political appointees from 2015, or they can align with political appointees in 2017 who have completely rejected science. And so I recommended that they align themselves with 2015 political appointees who were willing to carry forth the recommendations of scientists and side with science. And so we will see what happens. Now, obviously, we all have to kind of recognize the elephant in the room that we don't know what's going to happen with the legislative session now with everything going on with the coronavirus. And I'm trying to be very respectful of legislators and everything that's going on in their own homes right now. Uh, we're all being disrupted. So we really don't know what will happen, but whether it happens this session or next session, um, Connecticut legislators really have to reckon with the fact that they need to align themselves with science. So um, it's really a shame what happened at the federal level. The good news is that despite the federal government dropping the ball, 
other states have stepped up. Hawaii, California, and New York have all taken different steps to ban chlorpyrifos. <clears throat> the entire European Union has also banned this chemical. So there's no reason Connecticut can't. Even if farmers were concerned in Connecticut, all they need to do is look to other states that are much larger uh, agricultural states to find ways, and there are plenty of uh, safer alternatives to chlorpyrifos. And so, um, as I mentioned, it's still being used throughout Connecticut on golf courses, farms, as well as plant nurseries. And this really is putting our children at risk. So, and as I started to mention, according to Deep Zone data, 10% uh, of chlorpyrifos used in Connecticut is farms, 86% is golf courses. And in 2019, a low 590 gallons of chlorpyrifos was poured all over golf courses. The eight largest users in Connecticut are golf courses, and one farm alone accounts for one third of the chlorpyrifos used by farms. Now, I know this information because I did a FOIA request. It's frightening, actually. No one at DEEP, no one at the Department of Agriculture, and no one on the Environment Committee knew where chlorpyrifos was being used in Connecticut. But I felt that was really critical information to know. So I did a FOIA request and went to DEEP myself and went through the filings so that we could figure out exactly where chlorpyrifos was being used. But I think the fact that uh, DEEP in particular, that they had no idea where chlorpyrifos is being used, is really just another data point as to why we need to ban this chemical. Because how can we have a chemical with known dangers being used across the state in such large quantities and nobody knows it? There was no tracking and, um, and so that scares me. So that's just another reason why we need to be regulating it. And, and just to mention that, you know, Connecticut legislators have a strong history of regulating pesticides in the state. And Hewlett is responsible for getting pesticides banned from schools K through eight through the legislators. And that was a really successful uh, action taken by the legislature, as was uh, making you know, nicotinoids in Connecticut a controlled pesticide, which means that folks like you and I can't go and buy them. Only certified applicators can use neonicotinoids. <clears throat> So um, as I keep telling our legislators, they have a choice. They can choose between standing with us and acknowledging the overwhelming science, protecting our planet and our children, or they can align themselves with those who reject science and put industry interests above us. And I, I highly recommend saying that to legislators. They have to feel uncomfortable. They have to know what's at stake and they have to know how they'll be viewed if they do not take a stand on this issue. Uh, there was a great New York Times editorial, which had a quote, banning a chemical as clearly dangerous as chlorpyrifos should not be this difficult. A better functioning EPA would do just that, heeding the conclusions of its own scientists and honoring the agency's stated mission. Instead, countless children are being routinely exposed to an unnecessary risk while the nation waits for someone, anyone to take a stronger stand. I fully believe that it's up to the Connecticut legislators right now to take a stronger stand. And I want you to take a look at this map because this is everywhere that, is, that chlorpyrifos is being used right now. And it's staggering. Uh, there's a couple of little pockets like in the Northwest corner that's not using it. But other than that, across the state, there's a big cluster in Fairfield County and a big cluster right in the center of the state where there's some farming and a lot of golf courses. So looking at this map, um, really makes me stop and think about those communities living next to the golf courses and the farms using it. And I'm happy to share this presentation with anyone that would like to see it. We have this map up on social media. We actually have the map as a, um, a little video as well that shows the little pins pop up all over the place. And uh, I hope that, you know, when you see this map, you can take that back to your communities and show how there's really very few places in Connecticut that are not being impacted by this chemical being used. And that great. That. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, great. That was great. And I'm gonna, now I'm gonna 
open it back up and see if, if Anne, would you like to take this? And we should be able to do, oh wait, someone has a question. Oh, there's a question, let's see. Is there a retail name for this pesticide? Yes, um, Dursban and Lorsban, uh, D-U-R-S-B-A-N, L-O-R-S-B-A-N. However, um, you can't get it at a store. It's just like neonicotinoids where it's a controlled um, use pesticide so that normal people can't walk into Home Depot and buy it. It can only be applied by the applicators who have been certified to use pesticides. So that's a positive thing, but you know, we want it banned altogether because the EPA has stated that there's no safe use for chlorpyrifos whatsoever. But if you want to learn more about it, you certainly <clears throat> may end up seeing it being used, uh, being called Dursban and Lorsban. Awesome. Okay, great. Thank you. And now, great. That took just enough time to give Anne a chance to pull up the PFAS chemicals. And so as you see, there is a Q&A. Um, I'm not certain where people see it on their computer, but I see it on the bottom of my computer. There's a little Q&A. You can type in a question. It pops up, and then I can ask it, and they can answer it. So if you have a question, feel free to, to type it in. Anne, do you want to take it away? Sure. Can you hear me, Terry? I can. Can you hear me? I can. And, and okay, are good. you seeing my slides? I am. Okay. Um, well, I just want to thank you and Tara for that amazing and very informative presentation. I want to share that Tara and I work very closely together on these issues. And um, so we're both very interested in restrictions to ban chlorpyrifos and also PFAS chemicals. So I want to share with you a little bit more about PFAS chemicals, which you may have heard about in the news. Um, so PFAS stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. And it's a class of about 5,000 different chemical variations united um, in the fact that they have a fluorine carbon bond and they're very effective at um, having a number of uh, in consumer product um, impacts that are very useful in our society. So they're used in firefighting foam, for jet fuel fires and chemical plant fires because they actually suppress, they form a barrier and suppress the, um, the chemicals and gasoline and uh, suppress the fires. They're used in anti-stick cookware and food packaging to promote anti-stick and anti they're used in artificial turf to make artificial turf grass, um, you know, uh, effective at reducing uh, water and things like that. They're used in a whole host of consumer products. And what we're learning now is that we really need to restrict these chemicals, these whole class of chemicals as a class, not just one by one, um, but as an entire class. And the reason for that is that all of these chemical variations have a unique fluorine carbon bond, as I mentioned earlier, which are known as forever chemicals. And what that means is they don't break down in the environment. They are effective in the products that they're used, but we've learned over the recent years that they do not break down either in landfills or even incineration. So they're very harmful to the environment. And the two earlier versions of these chemicals, PFOA, and PFOS are considered long chain, which just means that they have longer fluorine carbon bonds, eight to 10 fluorine carbon bonds in the, in the um, 
variations that they used. And these were the most widely studied. Um, and they were phased out in the US because of the concerns of their health impacts and environmental impacts but we still find them in imported goods. Um, I want to just mention too that even the newer variations are showing the same health impacts and I'm going to get into that in a little bit. But overall, PFAS chemicals which have this fluorine carbon bond are finding that we have um, significant health impacts to kidney and testicular cancers, reproductive disorders, low birth weights, low birth size, uh, liver damage, high cholesterol, thyroid disruption, impaired immunity to vaccines, ulcerative colitis, and a whole host of other um, concerns. And what as I mentioned earlier, the newer variations of these PFAS compounds are not safe, um, despite industry arguments that they are. So the industry argues that these short chain um, PFAS chemicals, meaning that they have six or eight or less fluorine carbon bonds, have no association with health health impacts. And that is actually a very misleading statement. The fact is that there are not sufficient studies to show that these shorter chain, these newer variations of chemicals are safe. And what the research is showing um, is that in fact, these newer variations of chemicals, of PFAS chemicals, are indeed linked to the very same health impacts and environmental impacts that we're seeing from the earlier versions. So that's a major concern. And we're also seeing that these shorter chain in, um, PFAS chemicals have also the same impact on the environment in that they are not broken down um, by incineration or when they're discarded and they get into our environment, they've impacted uh, ground and drinking water sources across the United States. It's estimated that over 110 million Americans have drinking water that um, sources that have higher uh, risks of PFAS chemicals um, in their in their drinking water. So it's a real concern because again, these chemicals do not break down. So a couple of the top products that these chemicals are used in are firefighting foam and food packaging. So I just wanna spend a little bit of time talking about those two. Uh, firefighting foam, um, that is used to, you've all seen this, the pictures of the white firefighting foam um, used to uh, incinerate jet fuel fires or chemical fires or um, gasoline tanker fires. That foam is um, frequently uh, has PFAS chemicals in it and it's it's actually very effective at stopping these fires because they create a blanket that suffocates the fires. However, what we've learned is that these PFAS firefighting foam chemicals actually pollutes our environment and many of our drinking water and groundwater sources. Um, in June of last year in Connecticut, uh, in case you don't know, we had a huge spill of firefighting foam um, from a private hangar in Bradley International Airport in Windsor Locks that dropped 40,000 gallons of firefighting foam into the Farmington River, which to this day is still polluting that river and contaminating fish. Um, so firefighting foam is a huge concern and um, we know that there are safer alternatives 
uh, fluorine free foams used throughout the world that we can use now um, if we adopt safer um, regulations. The second issue of um, food packaging is another major source of exposure and um, food packaging that is anti-grease uh, often has PFAS chemicals. So food packaging in pizza boxes, microwave popcorn, um, takeout containers, um, grocery store takeout containers, all of those things that are typically anti-grease are often containing PFAS chemicals and those chemicals leach into the food and then, and then we ingest them. Um, these chemicals are also, um, we, they not only get into us, but these are often single use containers that get into our environment. And as we throw them out, they get, as I said earlier, they get into our landfills, our incinerators and leach into our environment. So what two things that we're working on this session, and obviously we're very much supporting the bill to us, but I just also want to uh, draw your attention to two additional bills that we are working on, which is Senate Bill 297, which is an act to restrict firefighting foam for any purposes where it's not required by federal law. Um, and then second is the House Bill 5291, which is an act to restrict food packaging that contains PFAS chemicals. We do not need toxic chemicals in food packaging. And both of these bills would significantly turn off the tap of the use of these chemicals uh, in our environment and do a significant job in protecting public health. So um, the last issue that we are working on and monitoring very closely is setting a strict health protective drinking water standard. Um, there will be a group set up legislatively and by the governor's task force that examines and studies the most health protective drinking water standard and we're working on that very closely. Um, there's not a bill that clarifies that yet, but I just want to flag that for you. And then um, if you have any questions, I would just um, refer you to our website. We're trying to keep you as updated as possible on the bills that we're working on with respect to toxic chemicals, not only PFAS, but certainly chlorpyrifos and I'd be happy, as Tara said, to answer any more questions um, as we go along. So I think I'll stop there and um, turn it over to you, Terry. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hang on a second. Oh, no. Uh, oh, here we go. All right, great. So now, so we had two presentations. Do people have questions? Now that we've got some uh, other folks on the on the on the list as attendees, any questions from the attendees? And so, actually, um, while people might be typing, and just a, a related, semi-related note in terms of um, uh, can you can you just tell us where the um, bottle bill is? Do you know where that is? Are you familiar with where where it might be in yes, the yes. lifespan? Yes, I'm happy to. So um, the bottle bill is a very important bill to reduce um, plastics in our environment through a number of very important initiatives. Um, it was heard in public hearing and we're still waiting to see. Um, you all probably know that, uh, as Tara said earlier, the General Assembly has closed a lot of meetings and so we're still waiting to see what the vote is on that bill, but it had a public hearing and there's a lot of positive um, 
push for the bottle bill to expand the bottle bill um, and expand our recycling of plastic containers. So hopefully we'll know more soon, um, but that's a really important bill that a number of us are following. Absolutely. Um, I actually just got a comment from here as a woman, Laura has said, synthetic turf contains PFAS as well. Yes. And yes. where do they use synthetic turf? Is that like the kind that they use on the soccer fields and stuff? Oh my gosh. Yeah, this is a huge issue. Um, I, didn't, I didn't bring this up, but this is a huge issue and a very big concern. So a lot of synthetic turf, artificial turf, um, has a number of toxic chemicals in it. And uh, studies have recently shown that many of the turf, the artificial turf fields um, have in their synthetic blades of grass, um, they're made with PFAS chemicals. So um, those PFAS chemicals run off of the blades of grass and get into groundwater and um, water sources nearby. So it's a huge exposure of PFAS chemicals into the environment and it's a real concern. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of towns have already installed these fields and are very reluctant to um, have a moratorium on installing any future fields, although there is a bill in the legislature right now to do just that. Um, so that is a real concern. It's not only PFAS chemicals in these fields, it's carcinogens, neurotoxins, uh, VOCs. Uh, there's a lot of concern about artificial fields. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, disturbing. You think about how many how many kids play on those, you know? Oh, yeah. Soccer yeah. teams and whatnot. And uh, actually, Laura has another comment saying, New Haven passed a voluntary ban on lawn chemicals. Uh, voluntary because state law prohibits municipalities from regulating pesticides. I suggest other municipalities pass such lawn chemical bans. I mean, that's certainly, it was certainly uh, going town by town is, is what got the fracking waste banned. So there's actually quite a lot of power in people um, mobilizing and organizing within their own town. Um, but, and, and actually, so just to, I, it's, it's funny, like the last few days have been so crazy with all the coronavirus and everything shutting down and stuff like that. Do we have any idea? I mean, obviously the legislature is still doing their business, but um, do you think they'll extend the session to get more done? Uh, do we do we think that they're you know are they going to come together and vote on things, or are they just hearing testimony at this point? Um, no. Yeah. This yeah, this is Anne. That's a really good question. And I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty confident that um, they're legally man, you know, they have a legal uh, stop date of May 6th um, to end the session. So there's a big concern right now to um, postpone certain hearings, but not stop the process altogether. So we want to continue to push our legislators on these issues, um, not only the Clopirifos bill, but um, our PFAS bills. And even if there's not public meetings where there are votes um, happening in person, we want to make sure that we're continuing to keep the um, the public engaged mm -hmm. and make sure our legislators are aware. So we don't have all the answers yet, but I do think that um, at least right now, what we believe uh, will happen is that May 6th will be the end of the current legislative session, unless they go into a special session uh, after that. Right, but, okay. We have to continue and to push. We certainly do. And I, I, I just want to reiterate that too. I live in a very red spot in Connecticut. Uh, and uh, my, I think my representative is actually the leader of the cons conservative caucus in Connecticut. So 
gives you an idea of, um, and he's, he's actually perfectly nice to me, but uh, doesn't, didn't last session really support any of the things that I wanted to support, even the stuff that I thought was a slam dunk, until the very end, we got to banning fracking waste. Uh, and he, I called him so many times and emailed him so many times about so many different bills. And when he saw that one was going to, I mean, he waited to the last possible minute. I'm not giving him any per points for courage or anything like that. But he at least didn't go down as one of the few Republican representatives that supported yeah. fracking waste. Like he at least, uh, you know, and I think honestly, part of the reason he finally voted for it was he'd heard from this one persnickety woman from Preston who just kept saying, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do the other. So yeah. my point is, keep pushing, you know, keep, keep pushing your legislators yeah. in, the, in the right direction. Because um, then eventually, hopefully this obviously this is coronavirus crisis will pass, we'll get a vaccine, we'll get some treatments, um, and we'll still have to deal with uh, saving our planet. So that's right. Keep on. We, keep and on. that's right, Jerry. And I think we've learned, um, but it's worth repeating that even five emails or calls from constituents makes a difference. So um, we have power. And um, I want to thank you, Terry, for leading these forums because it enables all of us to engage our power to call our representatives and our senators to um, act on the issues that we care about. So it, right. that's important. Absolutely. I am, I'm, I'm glad that, that people are finding these helpful. And uh, so that's, that's very cool. <laughs> it makes me feel good um does anyone else have any other questions that they'd like to or comments they'd like to to ask hopefully hopefully people are finding this um system fairly easy to maneuver around let me see if there's anything this is recording on i guess on the cloud so it should be available afterwards um ooh. that's interesting so this person oh hang on a second i got some some comments um oh yeah laura said leaf blowers spread pesticides such as chlorpyrifos and viruses around for sure leaf blowers are not a good thing leave mm. them alone let the let the pollinators use them um That's right. right uh after the last meet this um, john said after the last meeting i emailed my state representative and senator asking for the support to the bills that were presented one returned a response but said uh, that, that they weren't on the committee and so could not support at this time. I don't think that is, I mean, they can co-sponsor though, right? That's a cop out. That, there we go, <laughs> cop out. They're just stuck in the issue. It. Cause yeah, they can always co-sponsor a bill. They don't have to be on the committee. I mean, they might not be able to vote for it until it gets out of committee, but they can certainly co-sponsor it. That's exactly right. That's a cop out. Don't be fooled by that. Yes. Um, and I, so, and I, I think, and it's funny, I always send like the nicest emails. Well, oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Actually, you can co-sponsor. We are actively searching, seeking co-sponsors, and that's a great way to support the bill and help, you know, help encourage your fellow, you know, the fellow members that are in this committee to vote it out of committee so that they, you that's can then support right. it in the House or the Senate. That's right. Um, Margie asks, what is the best way to get involved to make these changes happen? And John also wanted to know, is there some specific representative or senator we should contact about these? So I think for Margie, you know, for um, saying, I think continuing to call and email um, is the best way at this point, honestly, with, with the way things are. Obviously, we're not going to be going there. We're not having, um, yeah. uh, you know, we're not going to be having public hearings and that sort of thing. So call and email. Margie and John, um, I don't know what district you're in or what town, but I would say send a personal note to your state rep and your senator and, or call them, you know, you probably won't get your, leave a message, but just say to them, you want to talk about these issues that are of concern. And just doing that registers with them that you're paying attention and you're following these bills and 
that's so important and so helpful. So just something simple like that is really huge. I just came back in. Um, I, I'm dealing with three kids who are overwhelmed right now by everything going on. So I popped out to go check on them and just pop back in. So I just wanted to mention a couple of things that we're doing um, as ways to get involved. So had we all been in person, I plan on bringing a stack of postcards that say Bancor Pierre Foss now. We're actually asking people to write handwritten letters to Governor Lamont asking him to support the bill, which is SB 301, but you can just say ban chlorpyrifos now. So if any of you are willing, please send Governor Lamont a letter handwritten to his office. His uh, address is very <laughs> down right on the web. Um, it is the ag commissioner under Lamont who is trying to block this bill right now. And we believe if we could get to Lamont that he would support this and tell his ag commissioner to stop acting like this and, and choosing the wrong side. Um, we've been generating a lot of letters. So that's one thing that you can all do from home pretty easily. And then I echo what Ann said, that's just a total cop out by that legislator. They can co-sponsor at any time. So I'd even write back to that legislator and ask them to please co-sponsor the bills, um, both all the PFAS bills and the Corpira Foss ban, um, it's ridiculous. They can get involved at any time. And uh, yeah, that's, that, I think that's great. And honestly, handwritten letters have tremendous impact because I mean, think about when you get a handwritten note in the mail, you woo, look, it's a handwritten note. Uh, someone took the time. And so those, those are powerful. So hopefully everyone on this call will take uh, 10 minutes in the next two days to send Governor Lamont, a, a note. Peter asked, regarding the bottle bill and recycling in general, I'm reading more all the time about the recycling going to places where the material is not handled responsibly. Is there any kind of legislation to regulate this? And I mean, I'm not certain, I can certainly hand this, I bet Ann knows better, but I think the answer is no, except for that the bottle bill actually places um, much, much higher incentives for people to actually recycle it and, um, appropriately and for it to actually get recycled. I mean, I, I dutifully se se separate out my recycling and bring it to the recycling part of the transfer station at my town, but I'm pretty sure it's not actually getting recycled. It appears that the trash and the recycling bins look very similar and that's all eventually ending up with the trash, which is very heartbreaking. Um, so I don't, and the other thing is that uh, people don't want our recycling. Like we're not as a country, really supporting the recycling industry in any real way. So it can't, it's, you know, it, for years our recycling was going to China and then they didn't want it. And then I think it was going to another uh, country and, and then they did Malaysia maybe, and they didn't want it. And so now it's, it is going to start, you know, now I think we're just basically incinerating it or trying to bury it. And so, um, Anne or Tara, do you guys have any Im impact or uh, input on that? Um, no, Terry, that, this is Anne. That's exactly right. Um, so we are facing a recycling crisis in the state and in the country. And um, the, the one major step that we can all get behind is supporting the bottle bill, which will expand the items that are recyclable and provide incentives for the um, industry to take these recyclables. Um, they have been extremely impacted by the ban from China, uh, which no longer takes our plastics and our recyclables. So um, towns, which you all may know, uh, are facing huge, where, where this used to be a revenue stream, it is now a huge cost to towns. Uh, so expanding and modernizing the bottle bill uh, is a good first step. And it will expand the number of things that can be uh, recycled. It will expand the revenue going to the industry that manages these recyclables and it's a really important step 
it's not the only step, but it is a very good first step that we should be passing in Connecticut where we have very low recycling rates uh, in the state um, because of the fact that single stream recycling is really not effective. It doesn't yeah. work. We thought it was, I mean, I'm sure everyone thought, oh, this is great. It'll be easier. It'll work. It doesn't right. work. People basically, they put right. so much stuff that's dirty that's into right. the recycling. I mean, back in the day when it was, when it was, you know, one, two, three, four, a glass, everyone cleaned everything and they separated it out. And now that's exactly right. So, and even a little bit of contamination will then render the entire the whole you know, bin thing. Yeah. is trash then and and none of it gets recycled if any of That's it's right. dirty at all so it's a real problem and the lauren actually has a comment saying in my apartment building people always put trash bags in the recycling which is is terrible and the thing is there is there, a lot of stores will have a plastic bag recycling place to bring your plastics but <laughs> but again that also has to be clean you can't bring dirty plastic but even plastic bags and you should always obviously the plastic bag tax slash ban was great for reducing plastic yes, bags. That's I mean, right. We we yeah. we wanted a ban. We got a tax, but the tax acted as a ban because no one wanted to give the state ten more cents. Um, but uh, honestly, it's but it's it's an issue of you know people really kind of having to change their ways, and uh, sometimes like with the the plastic bag tax. That was all it was really required. That's right. Yep. I, I mean, I loved it. People were so mad. I mean, so mad, defiantly saying, "I'm not going to pay another tax. I'm going to go out and get a reusable bag." And I was like, "Okay, good check." Yep. Um. Okay, so here, oh, Lad says, "I understand the only way to actually burn or to actually destroy PFAS chemicals is to burn it." At 2,000 degrees. Anyone else heard this? Um, no, that's a really, really good point. Lad is uh, obviously a very in tune and smart individual. Um, there's a lot of research that shows incineration of PFAS chemicals does not work. Um, it only potentially may work at very high temperatures over a consistent amount of time. And most incinerators, uh, as you all know, don't function at that level uh, consistently. So incineration of PFAS chemicals is not a good solution. And we are not recommending that um, as a solution overall nationally. Uh, so it's a very good question that he brings up. What we're recommending right now is that um, products are like firefighting foam. Uh, the state is recommending a take back program. And what we are recommending is that those that foam is stored safely until uh, safe uh, environmentally um, impactful disposal mechanisms are identified. And that is being worked on right now. Uh, and it's a long ways away. Thank you, Ann. Any other questions, comments? It's actually really fun to see them come in. This is kind of great. That Andy, was have no, that was a really good question. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. Um, Laura said, I suggest joining your local municipal environmental board or committee and acting as a unit, for sure. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, it's amazing how much you can do at the local level. I'm going to attend the next Democratic Town Committee meeting, actually. Well, if they have it. Maybe it'll be a conference call. <laughs> So Tara, do you, oh, Tara is muted again. Um, and do you have anything else you wanna add to the, to the end of this? This is being recorded. It'll, I think it's on the cloud, so it should be available. Uh, I think I said that, but anyway, uh, and the presentation should also be available, so that's great. 
Oh, oh wait, no. Laura said SB 296 would be the first step toward a minimum amount of recycled glass in wine and liquor bottles sold yes. In, yes. and distributed in Connecticut. Yeah, that's huge. And, and in terms of glass, I think wine yes. and liquor is something like 75 to 80% of all of our recycled glass. Yeah. Which is yeah. a shocking amount. That's right. And Laura brings up a really good point. And so we need to, ex when we say expand, this bottle bill wants to expand um, the recycled uh, containers. Uh, she brings up the, the very important point that wine and liquor bottles are a huge source of what we want to recycle. So um, that's, yeah. So we should all support that bill. It's really important. Yep, absolutely. Yep. It's, it's amazing. When I, I walked with my dogs to the local farm that's about half a mile down the street, and uh, we, I must have picked up tw 20 nip bottles. Oh, gosh. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So those, those, those bottles really need to, oh. we, need, yeah. we just need to do better. Yeah. So as we know, it ends up in the ocean. That's right. That's right. And so, no, in, just in response to your earlier question, Terry, I would just say um, I would thank everyone that joined tonight. And again, the bills to restrict chlorpyrifos and PFAS chemicals are really important ways to kind of turn off the tap of polluting our environment and harming public health. And again, with the bottle bill, that's an, another very important bill to uh, expand those items that are recyclable and help our industry uh, use that waste in a manner that um, doesn't cost them money and cost towns money. So we have to increase our recycling and this is a way to do that. So, so actually I also, I have, a, I have another question. I, I, and this is about the chlorpyrifos bill. Um, yep. I noticed that on Tara's map, one of the places that uses it in Eastern Connecticut, they're not a ton, but it's a farm that's really in Preston. It's right down the street. Okay. Um, or maybe it's Lydiard, but it's, it's very, very close. What is the best way to approach the owners about that? Should we, you know, should I actually go to them and say the way people did with the neonicotinoids? Like, I'd really appreciate it if you'd stop using this. Why do you use this chemical? It's very toxic. It's we don't really have farms using it around us too much. It's just, it's this one big nursery. Yeah, yeah. Is Tara still on the line or did she? She is have... not. Okay, so I would say, um... So, you know, I think we need to be mindful of who their customers are and who they're mm -hmm. selling to and all of that, but certainly raising the issue and providing some market pressure is equally important mm -hmm. um, on our local nurseries. Of course, we want to respect our local nurseries and farms and businesses, but we want to urge them to shift to safer alternatives. So talking with the owners of um, that nursery, I think is really important. Um, and I think and also just be as, like I really uh, connected with your word respectful. I yeah, think that yeah. being you know kind and respectful is, yeah. is obviously the best way to approach it because yeah, these, especially in these smaller businesses, this is their business and they may not realize that's right. how harmful that's right. it is and that sort of thing. So if you approach it from a sort of negative standpoint, they could get upset. Uh, Lad right. asked, what are the confirmed and tested methods that residents can use to remove PFAS from their tap water? Oh, so um, this is a very complicated issue and I don't want to give any misinformation, but um, it all depends on what your local water authority is doing. Uh, are you on a well? Um, we are not advocating for just moving to bottled water, certainly because bottled water does not necessarily uh, make 
mean that you're getting PFAS free water. Um, so it's a complicated issue. And I, you know, perhaps um, this person could contact me directly. There are a number of um, filtering mechanisms that can be used to phase out PFAS chemicals. Um, it's just hard for me to make a generalized statement not knowing uh, where this person is getting their water from. Right. But I would not advocate for shifting to bottled water. That is not necessarily a no. safe alternative. <laughs> no, you're just, you're, you're just drinking a different set of chemicals at that point. That's exactly right. Whatever has leached in from the plastic. That's uh, right. Marjorie asked, to clarify, when you say recycle as relates to bottle bill, do you mean returnable? Yeah, I think that's what we're talking about. We're increasing the um, the deposit. Yes, uh, on right. on and in, obviously uh, increasing the number of the types of bottles that can be. That's right. Yes, because um, right now, like it's just it's just like it's a very limited amount. It was written what in the seventies. Yeah, you know yeah. those sports drinks and coffee drinks and all those different things didn't exist, and so they haven't been added into the bill. So all those things, you know. There's no, no, there's no financial incentive to return them. And so people don't necessarily. That's right. Exactly. Yep. All right. And uh, Laura said, uh, businesses should only be having licensed pesticide applicators apply their pesticides. These people should know what's in the products they are applying. I, I, I totally agree with that. And I'm sure they are. I think they don't necessarily always know the full impact of what's in the products. Even if they know the ingredients, they don't know, you know, they may not realize, wow, this is toxic to all the pollinators i think that's right it's I highly think... I, it's highly ironic that nurseries use stuff that is toxic to pollinators and so yeah. our business is built around flowers yeah. and trees you know but um and, th and that is why respectful conversation mm -hmm. is is obviously the the first um way to do it you know I think that's right. I think, you know, these are local Connecticut industries want to do the right thing, um, but they also want to manage pests. And right. You know, so I just think the more that we can educate the public and have them, you know, have all of us have these conversations and ask questions uh, and demand safer products, uh, we're making an impact. Right. We're shifting the market. Yep, absolutely. That's absolutely. right. Absolutely. Great. Cool. Who is what set down? All right. So, any other questions, comments? It's been an active evening. It's been cool. <clears throat> Um, all right, so I guess we are done. No one has any more questions. Thank you so much for joining us and for being patient as uh, we operate our first webinar. All three of us, this is the first webinar we've ever done. So oh, one new message, hang on a second. Oh, Peter saying thank you. Thank Aww. you, Peter. <laughs> and honestly, so this initially was supposed to be a green forum um, at, uh, Saint, oh my goodness, which which church was it? It's in Cheshire, St. Peter's Church in Cheshire? I'm right, right? And yes. anyway, so Peter's, oh, someone's saying Peter's. Wonderful, thank you. And everyone has been so lovely um, to work with and we've just been, uh, it's been, I wanna thank them for their willingness to host this event. I know they were going to have wonderful snacks. I hope you had snacks at home. Um, we're just so grateful always for the the religious communities and the and the people of faith and whatnot that work together to put these events on for us. So I wanna thank the folks that work so hard in preparation. And then I also wanna thank everyone for their flexibility um, in light of the, the events of the past few days to switch this over to a webinar and um, bear with us. But I think it, someone said it went well, thank you very much. I'm glad of that um, and just uh, grateful for all of you. This is being recorded and I'll try, I'll send out, try and keep our, our website, the IREJN, website uh, updated with um, additional information 
about the legislative bills and I'll also email everyone with um, some key information as well. You know, I'll, I'll email you Anne's contact information, Tara's contact information in case you want to contact them directly or sign up for their mailing list because they are uh, generally doing a lot and uh, emailing out people different action items. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Terry, and thank you all. Yes, thank you. Have a great night.